The flood of 72 shocked the entire Roman Valley. To get a better grip on what it was like during the flood, I interviewed my grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Ben Evans of 96 Marlboro Avenue, South Wilkesbury, whose home was just blocks away from where the dike burst at Riverside Drive. The water completely wiped out the first floor and rose eight inches on their second floor. Now all they have left is memories and a few photos. People weren't worrying about a flood. So when they sent us home from work early on Friday, I went grocery shopping and stocked up the freezer with the meat. The policemen were driving down the road in their police car and they were saying, evacuate your homes. And that's what it sounded like. All the people were leaving from South Wilkesbury and you had to go just certain ways. And the people that were coming from the side streets were very polite. They would alternate so that, you know, nobody was going to be backed up forever. And we drove out to Ashley, where Dad's sister Eleanor lived. And we stayed there for a couple of days, and we really didn't know much what was going on. And we walked all the way from Parish Street and South Main Street, carrying our buckets and our brooms and our bottles of soda. And you're going through all this mud that you could have skated on. It was so thick. And the, the National Guard was around to see that there was no looting. And then, I guess it was after the 4th of July that we finally stayed overnight. Pop said we had to stay overnight. The third floor, the first two floors were ruined. Yeah, yeah, we were all sleeping in the back room on the third floor. So, so the first night we stayed over and we didn't know if the house was going to cave in or not the first night we slept. And there was nobody else on the whole street, right? Nobody. And you could hear sounds like from way, way, way far away. You Army, know, like the Army soldiers yeah. patrolling the air, yeah. and so on. And that then... Was very quiet, very dark. There were no lights, there was no electricity. And there was absolutely no motion. There were no people on the street. We were the only people, I guess. And, and you'd open the window and... and you, know, <laughs> you wouldn't hear anything. You'd hear absolutely nothing. Just dead silence and darkness, that's all. And then they told us when we, when we finally came back to start to clean up some of this mess, and they said, okay, don't drink the water. You'll die if you drink the no, water. Don't turn on your lights. Right or the house will burn down. We had the soda in bottles. And, oh, I know, we put, we put some water in the bucket to keep it cold. And after we used a few of the bottles of soda, the one that was left tipped over and the whole, the top of it fell into the water. So I wouldn't let them drink it <laughs> <laughs> it was contaminated. Yeah, you couldn't use the water. I think they were ready to kill me, and the water was probably fine. They were telling everybody to go get uh, tetanus shots. You know, if you got a if you got a cut or anything, and uh, Chris got a big scrape on his arm from the rose bush. So I guess we all went and got yeah. <laughs> got tetanus shots. Oh, and then, the really fun thing, we, we had Christmas of 71, we got this beautiful new Christmas tree that Susie bought when she came out of the convent. And we, it was so nice, we decided we'd put it down in the basement and just cover it all up with plastic, and then we'd only have to bring it upstairs in Christmas of 72. But in June of 72... <laughs> We were down there trying to get that Christmas tree out of the basement. And the, the water had, the, the mud must have been almost as deep as your knees, right? About a foot thick, the mud, the real liquid mud. This that, was mud. If you walked in it, it would pull your shoes right off, or if you had you know, knee-length boots, you know, you couldn't walk in the mud because the, the boot would stay there and you'd... Every time you lift your foot up. It actually kept me standing up. I lost my balance, 
but there was enough resistance from the mud that I didn't, <laughs> I didn't fall in. But anyway, the ornaments were all broken, the lights were all broken. Oh, and that was a mess to get up. You had to take it a handful at a time. Crushed ornaments, broken bulbs, you know, and everything. And you didn't know when you were going to get cut. And then the tree itself was a mess. <laughs> we took it out of that cellar a handful at a time, I think. So we never stored another tree in the, in the basement after but that? In the basement, the, the mud, this foot deep mud, you couldn't walk in it. So I had spare wheels and spare tires for my cars, mm -hmm. snow tires. So I laid them around here and there in the cellar so that you could walk on the tires without getting into the mud too deep, you know. That was pretty good. Worked out pretty good. But that mud had to come out of the cellar one shovel full at a time. That was and then you threw everything out on the front on, on the, the front tree lawn. It was up there was a nice little tree out there. When did we get rid of that? Anyway, there was a nice little tree out there. That the the uh, I think the stuff was piled as high as the tree, probably. It just piled. And then eventually they started. Yeah, when did they, when they get rid of it? Well, I think they, it. I guess they had the I soldiers. I think the army came in. I think and so. And big tank, well, big tractors and front loaders and stuff. And they came day after day after day after day because, well, the first time we tried to get a car in, the mud was down to a couple inches thick on the road, but it was just like butter or something. You, you, you couldn't steer the car. The wheels, you'd turn the wheels and then just skid along. I mean, it was the weirdest mud you'd ever want to... I don't know, I never felt anything like it before or after. But uh, it was unusual. we finally got the car in. People would come, you know, from other little towns around, and they they bring uh, they brought soda and uh, food, I think, you know, like sandwiches and and things well, like Salvation that. The Salvation Army would come by with their truck too. Yeah, yeah, lots of lots of people came, you know, like just on their own to help like that, which was nice. We had a front wall on our cellar completely demolished from under the front porch. And it had to be rebuilt right away or everything would cave in. So I started to build that and Larry Barrett and his father came one day. The first thing I know, Mr. Barrett went somewhere and got a truckload of cinder blocks and stuff and they pitched right in helping me. Had to, we had no time at all, we had the wall up under the front porch. The first day we went to work, your mother and I, and uh, it was like uh, the driving was still on, it was still kind of slippery, and uh, I think at least twice from here to Kings, uh, some soldiers came along and wanted to know where we were going. You know, I, I they were just being real careful that that uh, nobody was looting. Post office was closed for a while too. Yeah, what did they do with the mail? I don't know. And stuff? I guess there was mail that got all wet too, wasn't there? Uh, some, I guess. Not bad. They they tried to get it out of there before it got flooded too bad. I don't think much of the mail, I don't think hardly any of it got lost, actually. Oh, didn't it? Mm, that was good. They moved it out, but... Uh, and then someplace along the line? The mountaintop, I think. First. Yeah, on top. Oh. Our mail went right off the bat. But then they started to open up and they opened up the post office and they said, you can come back to work. But I delivered mail on North Franklin Street mostly. And of course there was nobody in any business or any homes that were living there yet. So I... <laughs> I would take what mail I could find and go up North Franklin Street and if I saw somebody cleaning out a house or something, I'd give them their mail. But you didn't want to leave it on, on an empty mailboxes because you never know when the people were coming back or if they were. So I had a lot of mail piled up in my, in my 
post office case for weeks after until things got straightened up. They weren't allowing any vehicles in the city except emergency vehicles. And of course, I guess that's post why they office, stopped us. Post office vehicles. Nobody would bother stopping a mail truck, so yeah, I drove around down in South Wilkesbury to see what our house looked like. It wasn't, it wasn't very Yuck. promising looking, but that was, that was before anybody was allowed in at all. But I had the preview because Yeah, I you had, didn't tell us that truck. right away. September, I think, before we got a trailer. We had to wait an awful long time. Yeah. It's a joke was in the Naval Reserve, and he borrowed a <laughs> fireman's hose from the fire department of the Naval Station. Well, they were allowed to do that. Like, if they knew somebody that was yeah, a victim, they, they could, you know, they could ask for equipment like that. And to help the people. So he brought the hose down, we hooked it up to the fire hydrant out front. We got a big pipe wrench and turned the water on. And I went around the back door at 94 and knocked all the plaster off the walls with the fire hose. <laughs> I don't know and why you're laughing. And squirted, <laughs> and squirted my way from the kitchen to the front, squirting the mud out the front of the house, you know. But that's how the plaster got off the walls at 94. They got knocked off with the fire hose. Right. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, if the house didn't <laughs> fall down, it was fine. We had uh, put an extension on the dikes, like several feet of middle piling, and all the dikes were piled up with this three or four feet of metal that was supposed to prevent any flood, you know, that would never, like the 36th flood would never come over the middle. But, uh, Blood came over the old metal pipes and everything else, <laughs> and then washed a big hole right in the whole dike there at Riverside Drive. And then they put up all that fancy schmancy stuff they have in downtown with the, you know, the... What stuff? The awnings, those awnings and, and those uh, oh, light the, standards that are rotting away. Oh, You know a dream is like a river Ever changing as it flows And the dreamer's just a vessel That must follow where it goes Trying to learn from what's behind you And never knowing what's in store Makes each day a constant battle Just to stay between the shores And I will sail my vessel Till the river runs dry Like a bird upon the wind These waters are my sky I'll never reach my destination If I never try So I will sail my vessel Till the river runs dry Too many times we stand aside and let the water slip away To what we put off till tomorrow Has now become today So don't you sit upon the shoreline And say you're satisfied Choose to chance the rapids And dare to dance the tide Yes, I will sail my vessel Till the river runs dry like a bird upon the wind These waters are my sky I'll never reach my destination If I never try So I will sail my vessel Till the river runs dry and There's bound to be rough waters And I know I'll take some falls With the good Lord as my captain I can make it through the mall Yes, I will sail my vessel 
Till the river runs dry Like a bird upon the wind These waters are my sky